Hello, and welcome to this evening's Brookline Booksmith virtual event with author Lisa Stringfellow to celebrate a comb of wishes in conversation with 2ET Sutherland. My name is Rachel, and I'm a bookseller at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. To those of you who are familiar with our store and our event series, it's wonderful to have you back. And to those of you who are here with us for the first time, welcome. We're so happy to have all of you here with us tonight at this event, and we really appreciate your support of an independent bookstore and fabulous authors by participating in events such as this and through your book purchases. Now this evening, we are thrilled to have Lisa and Tui here with us. Moderator Tui T. Sutherland is the author of the New York Times and USA Today best-selling Wings of Fire series, the Menagerie Trilogy, and the Pet Trouble series, as well as a contributing editor to the best-selling Spirit Animals and Seeker series as part of the Erin Hunter team. In 2009, she was a two-day champion on Jeopardy, and she lives in Massachusetts with her wonderful husband, two awesome sons, and two very patient dogs. To learn more about Tui's books or about all of her different pen names for those books, which I just found out, you can visit her online at tuibooks.com. We're so grateful to have you here tonight. Thank you for being with us. Now, I am thrilled to introduce author Lisa Stringfellow. Lisa writes middle grade fiction and has a not so secret fondness for fantasy with a dark twist. Growing up, she was a voracious reader and books took her to places where her imagination could thrive. She writes for her 12 year old self, the kid waiting to be the brown skinned hero of an adventure off saving the world. Lisa's work often reflects her West Indian and black Southern heritage. She received the inaugural Quelia Color of Children's Literature Manuscript Award in 2019 for an earlier draft of A Comb of Wishes. Lisa lives in Boston, Massachusetts with her children and two bossy cats. And when she's not writing middle grade fiction, she's teaching middle school students. To learn more about Lisa's writing, teaching, and specifically her time teaching a Harry Potter themed summer camp, you can visit her online at lisastringfellow.com. Now this evening, Lisa and Tui will be sharing conversation and some reading for A Comb of Wishes. In Lisa's debut, we meet 12-year-old Keela, who's working to cope with the grief of her mother's death. When she finds a magical mermaid's comb and is granted one wish, it seems like what she longs for might be within reach. But a wish so big will surely come at a greater cost. It's an honor to have Lisa and Tui here with us tonight. Please join me now in welcoming them both. Hi. Hello. Thank, Thank you so you, much, Rachel. Rachel. <laughs> Lisa, this is so much fun. I hope you can also see all these little chats popping up from people who are so excited. I about know. <laughs> it's, it's so amazing. Hello to everybody out there. It's such a weird mix of um, wonderful people. I'm seeing the, the ones I recognize from like all these different pockets of my life, which is great. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. I see a bunch of people from our book group, so. Um, yes, I do. Awesome <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you could all make it. Um, so I think, oh, and Rosemary. Sorry, I just saw Rosemary. Fly. She's your editor, right? Hey. Yes, she is. We used to work together Hi, when Rosemary. I was in Harper Collins. <laughs> I you used to be an editor. That. <laughs> I know, which is amazing. <laughs> So, um, well, okay, so let's dive in because um, I know I want to make sure there's time for everybody's questions, which I'm guessing there will be lots. So um, do you want to start? <laughs> do you want to start by like describing the book a bit and maybe reading some of it? Yeah, sure. So um, A Comb of Wishes, which comes out today, it's out in the world. I've seen it in stores. <laughs> um, as Rachel said, it's about 12-year-old Keela who... Um, has recently lost her mom and is struggling with that. And um, she finds something that allows her to have the thing that she would like most in the world, which is to have her mom back. So I'm gonna start at the beginning and just read a little bit of um, the, the chapter one, which is kind of a prologue, but we called it a chapter and uh, a little bit into chapter two. Um, for just for um, the sake of the audience, so you have a little bit of back, uh, background knowledge, um, it starts with the storytelling frame, Crick Crack, which gets explained a little bit later in the book, but um, it's a refrain that um, is used in many islands in the Caribbean and um, kind of just like part of like the call and response connection between a storyteller 
and uh, an audience. So you'll hear that at the beginning of the chapter, um, which is in The Mermaid, Ophidia's point of view. Chapter one, Crick Crack. I say Crick, you say Crack. Crick, Crack, this is a story. Down past the islands lit by the sun, beyond twilight swells of dusky sea, through midnight veils of the crushing abyss, another world hides under the waves, the other side of the mirror as it's known. Through these depths swam a sea woman. The full moon rose and spilled its milk into the water and light glimmered over dark brown skin. Her scales flashed green and gold. Foreboding drifted on the tide and urged her on. When she reached the cavern, the quiet struck her first. No gentle trill greeted her as it usually did. In her hiding place, only a broken tumble of rocks and stones remained. Hope dissolved as she groped through the cavern, trembling. Her tail thin thrashed as she plunged her arms into every corner. But the silence told her that the box was gone. Her pupils narrowed into dangerous slits. The sea woman rode the cold current into the briny deep. She would reclaim the box and what was inside. She must. Time and tides would decide. Crick, crack, the story is put on you. Chapter two, sinking sand. The note waited on the kitchen table. Keela didn't even have to pick it up or read Pop's blocky print to know what it said. Her fingers hesitated over the paper. She and Pop hadn't gone diving or done anything normal together in months. She missed the salty mist on her face and the trampolining waves. Kila lifted the note and balled it in her fist. She took a deep breath and then shut the door of the empty house. The gravel crunched under Kila's feet as she crossed the street into a dense patch of trees. A foot-worn path wound its way between towering cabbage palms and sandbox trees. The gully sloped and she stepped around the snaking roots of a bearded fig. Leaves rustled overhead, a monkey skittered across a bough. With the push of a branch, the forest ended. Keela looked out at the waves lapping the shore, the beach, the one place that felt like home. She walked along the water's edge, her canvas bag hanging lightly from her shoulder. When Keela was five, she had found the first piece of sea glass, blue like a cloudless sky. You found a mermaid's tear, Mum had said. Let's try to find a whole rainbow. They had found every color but orange, the rarest. Now Keela stayed up at night thinking about that last piece, Mum's piece. Keela peeked into her bag at what she had collected that week. Several pieces of sea glass, sharp edges worn away by water and sand. The colors rippled like the surf, translucent green, white, and a piece that glowed golden amber. Her mother had taught her to make jewelry from these gems of the sea. When something caught her eye, she tried to imagine how a person could wear it. A charm hanging from a crocheted necklace, Wrapped in wire to make an, an, an anklet, she never knew exactly what she was going to make until she got started. In these broken bits of glass, trash to some, Gila saw possibilities. The broken made beautiful. She took out a piece and held it to the sky. Green brightness spilled softly into her hand. She remembered the old island folktale about sea glass. Could sadness really make something so beautiful? I'll stop there. So. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Thank <Aww>. you. <laughs> I know but you could have a piece of sea glass. So this is something like what Keila was looking for. Is that orange? orange? It is orange. So it's the rarest okay. one? The rarest. <laughs> rarest except for. SD help me. Etsy help me out. <laughs> if I had to find it on the beach, it would have been a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. 
Well, I know you couldn't um, like read the chat and the book simultaneously, but the, there was so many chats going by that were like, that's beautiful. This is so great. I can't oh. Let's see it as a movie. So. Oh gosh. <laughs> really nice. Yeah, that was that awesome. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> It's such a great beginning. I do love that you start with Ophidia, the mermaid. Um, did you always start that way? Has that always been the first chapter? That chapter has been rewritten so many times. It, it's been in the book and out the book. And people who have um, been in writing groups with me have known like this intense struggle <laughs> that I've had about <laughs> whether to have the any actually any of Ophidia's chapters um, in her voice. Um, you know, because it was like rule breaking in middle grade, like you don't have adult POVs and grownups telling parts of the story. And so, um, but it, it, it needed to be there. I felt like it, it, we needed that kind of little bit of a fantastical introduction before we get to where Keela is. A hundred percent. And also it just, um, like it pulls you through and it makes it less of like, this, there's this like scary mermaid over there and more of like what she's feeling like of course she wants it back given everything that's happening to her I, I love I love that like juxtaposition between the two of them yeah and I think there's so much um misunderstanding that that starts out I mean they both have their different perspectives they well they both have lost something so Keila's lost something and Ophidia's lost something um Keila feels like you know she's you know, had something taken away unfairly, her mom and, and Ophidia feels like she's had something stolen. And so the way they approach each other to get what they want kind of, you know, has this like little tension around it, but um, it's definitely um, been fun to write that. Yeah. And then like, see the parallels between them sort of. Um, where did it like, so you said you've been working on this for a while, like what got you sort of started thinking about this? Like what was sort of the initial like scene or inspiration? Yeah, so this story has been um, uh, in my head and getting on paper for a number of years. I started the first draft in 2013. So way back, uh, I was not even in, living in Boston yet. I was back in Kentucky. Some, some of my Kentucky friends are in the chat. Um, and I, um, I had started the year before trying to, I decided I wanted to try to write. And um, I had heard, heard about NaNoWriMo, which is National Novel Writing Month. Um, and for people who don't know, it's a challenge that writers take to try to write a whole novel in 30 days. And so if you're an adult, a grown up, you try to write 50,000 words in 30 days. And if you're a kid and doing the Young Writer Program, you can kind of set your own goal. So the year that I did it was my second year doing NaNoWriMo and um, my class was doing the Young Writers Program. So I actually wrote the book with my students in the classroom Aww. and um, I when I was thinking about like what kind of story I wanted to write um, I had just read a book called The Tale of Emily Winstead by Liz Kessler which is about a 13 year old girl who on her birthday goes to the pool for swim practice and discovers that putting her feet in the water makes her grow a tail <laughs> so she found out she was half mermaid <laughs> and that was kind of a fun book um, but like a, you know, a little lighthearted. And I had also read another book called Coraline by Neil Gaiman, totally different atmosphere and mood. That story is about a girl who has moved to a new apartment and her parents are kind of busy. So she starts exploring and it's kind of um, darker and, you know, she has to be brave. So I, I had those two kind of book ideas in my head and I kind of wanted to blend them and see what would happen if I wrote a, a mermaid story which was maybe a little bit scary and had a character who, you know, had to interact with this little bit scary mermaid. And, um, but I also thought about setting it in a place that was familiar to me into my heritage. And so that's how it was set in, in the Caribbean. So, um, but yeah, 2013 was when I first started drafting and it's been through changes, but um, it's, it's come a long way. And I, but really the core of the story is still there from when I started it. Wow, that's amazing. What a great idea, like to, to combine Emily Wittensnap and Coraline. Like I don't think anyone would ever have thought of that. <laughs> but it's like, it's so unique. Like neither of those occurred to me as I was reading it. Like it's so uniquely itself. Um, that's amazing. Um, so you sort of mentioned this, the setting. Is that, is, St. Rita is not a real place, right? Or 
because I couldn't find it on Elitist? <laughs> no, people have said that to me. They're like, I Googled it and it didn't turn up anywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> good, because I didn't want it to. It is fictional, um, but it's based on a real place. So as I mentioned, my um, my heritage is West Indian. So my dad and, and my dad's family emigrated from Barbados. So St. Rita is basically Barbados with some creative license taken <laughs> when I wanted to. Yes. Um, but that's kind of what was always in my head when I was thinking about the setting and, and the sounds and the food and the music was a place that, you know, was my imagination, but was based on a really, a very real place um, that just had such a rich culture. Yeah, it felt really real. I, I lived in the Dominican Republic for a couple of years and there were things that like made me remember what it was like living down there and um, just the whole thing. It felt like I could totally imagine Kila like on the beach and everything. I thought, yeah, yeah it was really cool. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I love all the, the Caribbean folktales that you've like woven all the way through and the fact that it's something that connects Kila to her mother, like that they both love them. Were they... Yeah, I know yeah. I read in your author's note, the thing about the mermaid tears, which is really cool, that that's a real thing. Um, were there other specific folk tales that like got drawn in, like as you were researching or anything you had to leave out? <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a lot of mermaid lore that um, is woven into parts of the stories, not so much like full stories that like um, have been passed down, but um there's a point in the book where Keila's sitting on uh, the couch and she pulls out this you know, very well-worn book that her mother had uh, given her and it has folk tales and she's flipping through and the stories that I could mention. So there's some, there's um, the one about the heart man um, and there's, they talk, there's the stories about duppies. Those are like real characters like in Barbadian and in Caribbean like folklore. Um, and I, so I pulled from stories that I heard um, the, the story about the mermaid's tear um, really is also kind of a lore, a, a story that, you know, basically a mermaid who um, was captured, um, her, her mermaid sisters cried and their tears washed up on the beach. And those are what we see as sea glass are the tears of mermaids. So I changed the, the story that I had found a little bit. The, this, and of course, there's so many different with folklore like there's never one version because of like this oral tradition, things are just kind of turned around each time a, a storyteller tells a story, it changes a little bit, um, but there's that. And um, there's little things like, um, you know, I have my nod to um, Hans Christian Andersen and the Little Mermaid. Um, so the thing that Ophidia worries about if she doesn't get her comb back is dissolving into foam. And that comes from the original Little Mermaid story. So definitely nods to lots of different types of stories from different parts of the world. Yeah. And yet, and like, like I don't, so I've only ever read one other book with scary mermaids and it was like an adult horror book. <laughs> I don't usually read, but I was like, what? Scary mermaids? This can't be that bad. And it was terrifying. Um, so this was like the right level of scary for me. <laughs> that That's good. And I mean, and I think the thing that it's so, um, like there, the traditional mermaid that people imagine, you know, think about like Disney's Little Mermaid. And I'm excited that there's a new Disney movie coming out next year with um, a black actress playing Ariel, which is going to be really exciting. Um, but, you know, we usually think of, you know, very fair skin, light hair, kind of a Eurocentric. And there's so many mermaid stories from all around the world. So one of the um, things that I wanted to pull from were some of the West African and Caribbean um, stories of mermaids. And so, um, you know, there's a character, uh, a spirit, a deity, really, uh, Mami Wata from um, West Africa that um, is a very, she's a, a water spirit, you know, mermaid, but she, you know, is uh, someone who can bring people good fortune. And so um, there's that where the idea of like wishing and wanting to please the mermaid um, in the Caribbean, there are versions, different versions of her on different islands. And so there is a tradition of like, you know, Black mermaids, but I think um, we haven't seen it really in a lot of different stories yet. Um, I know Tracy Baptiste has done some work with, with in the Rise of the Jumbies, which was awesome. Uh, she had a character, Mama Dulu. Um, and so I'm excited that I could bring, um, you know, 
again, another example, Shakira Bourne also, who is in the audience I saw, uh, had Josephine Against the Sea uh, with her mermaid character. So again, like there's a, a tradition there that hasn't just been um, represented until now. And it's great that like these books are starting to come out. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I mean, and she's just so cool. Ophidia is amazing. Can I can I ask where you got her name from? Like, because that is beautiful and perfect. And I didn't know where yeah, that Yeah, I had such a hard time choosing her name, but like it actually, uh, it's a fun fact how, how she got her name. So I mentioned Mami Wata. And one of the things about the deity, that water spirit is um, she is seen and depicted as carrying a snake. So a lot of the pictures, if you, you know, Google her, you'll see like a big kind of like a, python or boa constrictor, big snake around her shoulders. Um, and I, I, thinking about that, I gave Ophidia a lot of snake-like movements and things like the, her eyes narrowing into slits are all very, you know, serpentine. Um, so her name, Ophidia, if you Google that name, is actually the scientific word for the family of reptiles known as snakes. So she, her name is literally snake. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. what Ophidia means. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that's so awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> I actually named the uh, the dragon continents after like scientific names of like moths and butterflies, I think. Moths and dragonflies. Oh, that's awesome. No, yeah. I love like one of my favorite things is um, looking up like etymology of words and, you know, seeing where things come from and well, how could you play with those things? Yeah. Yeah. That is so awesome. Does Keela, what about Keela? Does she have a, like, does her name come from somewhere? Her name doesn't mean anything, but I, when I was thinking about the setting, um, I actually did a search of like um, popular or common girls' names in Barbados. <laughs> so okay. she was, she was high on the list. And I was like, you know, saying the names aloud and seeing how they sound. I'm like, like Keela. <laughs> so that's I totally where do she that. came from. <laughs> I saw a tweet from someone the other day that was like, you know, writers are always teased that they're constantly Googling like how to commit murder, but actually like, because we're always on baby name websites, they must just think we're all pregnant. <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. I have so many name websites bookmarked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's beautiful. I've never heard Kilo before and I really like that one. It's really Thank neat. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I actually, just to go back to the, the NaNoWriMo thing you were talking about, I think that is so clever too, because I was like, as a teacher, I don't know how you possibly have any time for writing because I feel like all the teachers I know are just overwhelmed. Like, they, you know, there's no time you're, you, you're working like all day. There's no time off. Like you're constantly, you can't have a day where you're like, I feel like Googling the web today. <laughs> it's like, nope, right. Right there. they're looking at you. <laughs> So to like incorporate um, that you're writing and they're writing at the same time is so genius. I know. And, and I can't say that I did it to, you know, like, I <laughs> squeeze some writing time into work. <laughs> no, but uh, how fun <laughs> for them my, too. My secret ploy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> yes, exactly. But no, it is, it's fun. And I guess the thing that is really, you know, and maybe my students can say in the chat <laughs> if they agree with me or not. But the thing uh, that, is so enjoyable is that you're kind of like a community and we all see ourselves as like working towards the same goal. So, you know, they know they're all working on their individual goals and they have a story and they're struggling sometimes or they're on fire sometimes and just writing away. They see me working and sometimes, you know, I'm doing well and other times I'm not doing so well and we all kind of commiserate together. So it's really like a community and um, it's it's been fun and I've done it for nine, this, yeah, this past November was my ninth year doing it with students. So the students that um, were in my class the year that I, this was my NaNoWriMo novel, um, just started college. So they're freshmen. <laughs> That's how, <laughs> how much time has passed. <laughs> That's amazing. But, uh, I wonder if any of them will go back to the books that they wrote, you know, and, and do something with them later. Cause I wish I, I had some of them do. Sometimes I, you know, we have Google docs now and everything's in the cloud. And so, you know, and I'm shared on many of their, their stories. So sometimes, you know, I'll get like a little notification in my email that some student who's like in eighth grade has opened their NaNoWriMo document and like Aww. they're working. And I was like, yay, that's great. <laughs> they're still working on that story. 
Oh my so, God. That's so great. <laughs> this would have been my dream, like at, when I was in school, like fifth or sixth grade. If so, if a teacher had been like, "I want you to write a story for an entire month," I would have been just like, "Yes, please." <laughs> <laughs> this is all I want to do in my life. And my fourth grade. Was- I mean, and it's hard. I mean, you talked about time. Like we have so many demands on things that we need to do, but that is one little window where you know, even if we just give part of the class every that, and that's always my goal with them, as I say. Every day you will get time to write, you know, even if it's only 15 or 20 minutes sometimes because of what else is going on. Um, And we just do. And then we're all just clacking away at the at the key. So it's really been great. And and exactly what you said about community, because it feels very lonely sometimes to be here. Just (laughs) me and my dog. (laughs) (laughs) So to know everyone else is there, too. That's really lovely. (laughs) How uh, so when it's not November. Where, how do you fit writing in, like around all the other things you have to do? Around a teacher's schedule. And a <laughs> so, mom, too, right? You have kids, right? Yes, and a parent schedule. So, <laughs> I mean, like when I was drafting the book, a lot of it was nights, um, you know, and everybody's in bed. And, you know, I might do a little bit, you know, after they're all in bed or the opposite, like get up early and, you know, do a little bit before people wake up. That's been harder over time. I'm just not a night owl person as I've gotten older. So, you know, weekends are really, you know, helpful. Um, And then also like school breaks. So trying to, um, you know, find like, okay, I've got winter break coming up or spring break or the summer, the summer, I'm going to get so much done, you know, (laughs) sometimes up and down, but um, that's been, and and since I've been kind of in now the publishing process, um, trying to work with, you know, my wonderful editor about like deadlines around my school schedule um, definitely helps, but it's not easy. And I, and I, I do have to, I've learned to have to give myself some grace with, you know, I can't necessarily do, you know, those writer's accents where people say, you must write every day if you're a real writer. No. No, <laughs> not necessarily. It's just not possible and, uh, sometimes. And especially not. when you just finish something, I need to like lie down for a month every time I finish a book. So. <laughs> exactly. And I've learned that thinking about your work is, is work too. So I can be yeah. somewhere doing my grocery shopping, thinking about something and that's forward progress. So Absolutely. Yeah, totally. That counts. Being in the shower. Like this is all work. <laughs> and also to like take a step back and then go back and read it after a few weeks is really helpful to like get to yeah. give it a little distance, I think. Distance. That's what, what my students are actually doing right now. We put our NaNoWriMo novels aside in November and we're just now pulling them out. So we've had a good month, you know, six weeks almost to, yeah. you know, forget about what we wrote and, um, their feelings have changed about as, as all writers, you look like when you're writing it, you're like, this is amazing. And then you look at it (laughs) a few weeks later and you're like, what was I thinking? (laughs) But it's important work. And that's how you make it better is to get the words down first. Yeah, absolutely. And then like to, I mean, because I think revision is the hardest thing for young writers to learn. I mean, it was for me. I was like, nope, this is perfect. First time through. It is perfect. (laughs) Yes, exactly. I don't need to revise. I worked hard on it the first time. (laughs) That's how I meant it to be. It's exactly right. (laughs) No, I think that's what been one of the things that surprises um, young people when I've talked to them and my students in particular about how how much revision is part of the publishing process. And you know, I'll say, you know, they'll ask me sometimes, how, how many times did you revise, you know, your book? And I'll say, well take a guess and you know okay maybe a little bit higher than that and then you know and I said guess what I got it all shiny and polished and I sent it off to agents and an agent finally said yes it's wonderful and guess what we did next we revised it some more (laughs) and then (laughs) and then we got it really shiny and perfect and we sent it off to editors and guess what we did next we revised it some more (laughs) so it's just something that is important for them to learn that you can always make your your work better and you know, there's lots of people who want to help you get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It wasn't until I was an editor that I learned how to revise because I, I started thinking I was able to look at other people's work and be like, maybe fix this. And it was all like knowing that I was trying to be helpful. I could listen to people who were trying to be helpful to me, you know? Um, so it helps. (laughs) Are you working on some, I know it's like the first day your book came out. So maybe this is a terrible question, but do you have a plan for your next book or are you working on anything else? Or are you taking a break? 
I am working on something else. So um, I did have a, a two book deal. So I'm working on my book two, which is going to be another standalone fantasy. Um, so not tequila story, another character story. Um, so hard at work trying to get that done so I can turn it in soon. <laughs> so uh, all I can say about it is it's, um, I, I love fantasy and I love um, fairy tales and folk tales. So it's kind of a, a different, um, totally different setting, um, but it's a kind of a take on a princess in a tower story um, with some West African influences to it. So I'm really excited about it. Oh, good. Oh, yay. <laughs> Now we can all be excited about it too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Well, before we um, go to audience questions, I did want to ask if you had any books to recommend. This is like something I, I like oh, to do yeah. at each of these events. So I am always asking my students for recommendation and they all know that I'm uh, a bookaholic and I buy books and then put them in a big stack and, you know, eventually read them all. But um <laughs> So one I just read um, this week, so this is a picture book. So, you know, a little book, but it's really not, um, I mean, it, it's, I would say this is great for middle schoolers to read also. So it's the 1619 Project, Born on the Water. The, it's co-written by Nicole Hannah Jones, who uh, wrote the, the New York Times 1619 Project, and then also the recent book. And then Renee Watson, who I love all of her books. Um, you know, piecing me together. So this is just such a lyrical piece of um, writing. Um, the two of them together created all of these, like basically poems. And it starts off with like, I think something that a lot of black children have experienced because I, I experienced this in, in, high, in middle school too, where you're given a family tree project and you're asked to write about where your ancestors came from. And, you know, with the history of enslavement, it sometimes hard for you know black children to think about where you came from and so this book just so wonderfully through the poetry talks about like that the people had a past and had a culture it didn't start with enslavement and um, it's just so beautiful the poetry in this book so I would recommend that who's the artist I love the artist. that one sorry <laughs> Nicholas Smith wow it's beautiful it is just I love the artwork in that um this is like one of my favorite books ever, One Crazy Summer. And <laughs> I know it's going on 10 years, a little bit over 10 years old. And it's got enough medals to like weigh the book down. But <laughs> we just finished reading this with my fifth graders. And I just love, uh, even it's historical fiction. I just love it because of just the, the relationships and that family can be messy and just um, not, it can be imperfect but it's still like the love is still there. And this is just, I love this book and we teach. I'm, I'm so happy to, to have that. And then one I'm excited to read that I haven't started yet, just came out recently. This is um, Olo Bemisola Rude Perkovich's new book called Operation Sisterhood about um, these four sisters. And it's just, I've heard such wonderful things that it's all about, you know, black joy and sisterly love and working together, you know, in New York City. Um, so I'm really excited to, to start this one soon. Do you have books that you, I know you are always reading. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I was trying to think about um, anything that connected to this. I don't have a copy of The Jumbies, but you already mentioned that, which is um, so great. Uh, this is the one our book club is reading next, which I haven't started yet, but I will. I will be starting this like tomorrow. <laughs> I need to start it too. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about it. See you, Martinez, in the moment, beginning of everything. Um, I guess the one I was thinking, um, you know, Amari and the Knight Brothers um, also has like an amazing black, black girl heroine. Um, and I really loved this one. And then the whole storyline with the mother um, made me think of Sal and Gabby Break the Universe, which is one of my favorites. Uh... Where, um, he's also like lost his mom and sort of does bring her back. In, and there's always, and it's, with consequences, it's very different the way he does it, but, um, but I kept thinking of, of, of that, like, you know, the, the, the feelings, the like grief and the, that Keila is going through. Um, yeah. And, yeah. So, um, and I and think, I think that's so relatable to a lot of 
kids on different levels, you know, either, you know, they maybe has, have lost someone like a grandparent or you know, maybe even a parent or, you know, even pets. I mean, you know, the, the people, the, the, the things in our life that we care about and love. And so um, I know like, Home wishes, you know, has it has its scary moments. It's got its like action, exciting moments, and then it has, you know, those moments that, um, you know, sometimes seem really sad. But I think like all of those things are just, you know, to see things and be able to process them is like really a, a great way to like think about and, and go through your feelings um, as a young person. So hopefully, that helps too. Yeah, I think I think so. I, oh, I guess I, there was one other question I was going to ask, which is like, if you found a magic mermaid comb, like what wish would you make? Is there any wish that's safe to make? <laughs> There's everything has consequences. It's like, you know, when you, they talk about like a genie, you know, like you have to be in a lamp, be really careful how you phrase it because like it could come out totally different. I think the writer in me would like wish for like, you know, little el- elves to come finish my manuscripts. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a lovely thing. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I've, I've thought about this before. Somebody asked me that question once before. And I, I probably would be like Gila. I probably would would think about people who I love who, you know, aren't with us anymore. And, you know, to have that little bit more time to spend with them, I think probably would be my wish too. Yeah. Oh, I want to say something, but it will spoil part of the book, so I won't. Um, but uh, <laughs> like you do, you do really smart things with that. I think about um, what happens with Gila's wish, um, and um, there's also there's a great moment where she asks Miss Innes, I think, about um, what she would wish for, and she talks about wishing for someone else to be happy. Right? I wish for my loved ones. Yeah. To be happy. Also, a really good answer. That's like, yeah. That I think that was one where I feel like she's starting to question her choices and thinking about like, you know, what makes me happy is important, but maybe, maybe other people being happy would make me happy. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just so well done. I really, really love Thank it. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I realized this is totally unrelated and not deep at all, but um, that I accidentally painted my nails exactly the right color to go with the cover. <laughs> Yay, they match. <laughs> My fourth grader and I were painting our nails this weekend and I was like, oh, how lovely. Oh, I know. Well, I, and I've been in love. It's funny that, you know, the background that I have with the book, I had, um, you know, a Pinterest board while, all while I was drafting where I would collect pictures of things that were inspiring me. And so I had this, you know, this green ocean scene. Um, I had a couple of these I found where the water was just kind of bluish green. And so the illustrator who did the book cover I think took a peek at that and drew drew inspiration. So Michael uh, Makira Mwangi just did such an amazing job with the cover, and you kind of get that sense of wonder as well as that little bit of Menace. suspense that something <laughs> exactly something dangerous is just around the corner. Um, so it's it's great, but I love that green blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic cover. I love it so much. <laughs> um, so I think it's. We can go to the the Q and A. I don't know if we. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and actually, as you were saying just now, oh, I love this so much. It's the same in the chat, the same in the Q and A. Uh, I wish I could. Oh. There was like a way to <laughs> show you everything that everyone's saying. Um, but there are a lot of comments saying, "I cannot wait to read this," and especially when uh. you're saying, this sounds so good or so uh. suspenseful. Um, yes. Yeah. So I think a lot we of can't it- save the chat, wait, Lisa. You should. Oh no, it hasn't saved. Oh, three of you. <laughs> <laughs> we do also have. Oh my goodness, we have so many questions to get to. Let's see. Um, oh, here's one wondering actually about. I know you're mentioning the opening the book opening of the book rather is one where it was in and out again um and this person's wondering if there are any actually deleted scenes or deleted chapters that didn't make it in in the end there so pacing was something that I had to work on and um that meant so I'm I'm a purple prose person sometimes and I can kind of go overboard with my flowing descriptions of things (laughs) and so so they're like little segments of things that had to get trimmed out because like things needed to move along. Um, But one fun fact is um, the last chapter of the book used to be the first chapter of the book. 
So the very last chapter uh, where she's on the boat with her father and they're getting ready to dive used to be chapter one where um, she, instead of finding the box in a coral cave, she actually was diving with her dad and found the box. Um, and I wanted, that was again, when I thought I need to start with the Phidia that I moved that chapter and just cha- flipped everything around so that it's the way it is now <laughs> without saying anymore. <laughs> there was actually, I think, another question about whether it was written kind of in chronological order or if that was the intention at first or if you were doing kind of scene. You scene. asked me that question in a email about did I write, did I have any particular scene in mind first when I started? Um, and I did not write chronologically. Um, actually, so Phidia's character was really much more clear to me first. And um, when I was thinking of like the premise, so the first chapter I remember I, I wrote was, um, I don't know what number it is now because the numbers have all changed over the revision process, but it's the chapter where um, she, uh, there's a storm and she comes out of the ocean in her mer- mermaid form and she cl- claws her way up the hill. That was the first chapter I, I wrote. So oh my god! Later in the book, <laughs> that is such a like vivid scene that, that I, that's the one that's going to stay in my head. <laughs> the I was like, that was like, like that. the the little bit monstrous mermaid that was in my head <laughs> when I first started. That's actually my first book too. I, I started by writing like scenes at, that were just like the first ones that came to me instead of going chronologically. I think it's useful yeah. for your writers to hear that they can do that, right? Like you don't you have can to do it. That. You know, you totally can. do whatever order makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you're inspired by first, right? Yes. Do you think actually, because going off that we have some questions wondering about um, the most satisfying part of writing the book, do you think maybe some of those scenes that came to you first were amongst the more satisfying? Um, they were satisfying because they were fun and enjoyable to write, but I would say the most satisfying um, would be the ones that I struggled with maybe the most that I finally felt like worked themselves out in the end. So probably the last couple of chapters would fall into that category because um, the ending of the book actually shifted a few different times, like how should it end? And, um, you know, the it's, again, another fun fact about the book is that it had at least three different endings over the course of the manuscript. And um, without spoiling anything, the ending that's now in the book is actually the the first ending that I wrote. (laughs) And so version of it, very, very close to that first one. And one of the things that um, that the reason I didn't keep it the first time was that um, there were some things with the character development that I just didn't feel like was working. And so, you know, we changed it and I changed it. But then I think in the end, because of all of the revision that happened, the characters, especially Lucadia's character became so much more nuanced and layered and you understood like why she was doing the things, then it made the current ending make sense. So I could go back to it. (laughs) When you're talking about character development too, um, we've got another uh, wondering about kind of characters throughout and asking if there are background characters that you wish you could spend a bit more time on or wish you had been able to spend more time on? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to explore, you know, I did a lot of work on Lissy's character. Um, she, um, I think, is such a good friend to Keela, you know, but it, in, in early versions, she's one of those, I, this is something that I tell my students, like when you're reading over your first draft to look look out for disappearing characters, like somebody who's there and then all of a sudden, like, they're just gone. Lissy was one of those characters in like a first draft, like, I introduced her as Keela's friend and then like, poof, she was gone the rest of the book. And then somebody asked me like, did she have a friend? And I was like, oh yeah. So, you know, she came a long way to being kind of a central part of the story. Um, You know, but I'd love to explore her more. I'd love to explore her grandmother, Miss Innes more. Um, I feel like there's there's a couple characters like that that would be interesting to, to spend more time with. I want um I want like a like a special extra bonus scene of um Mira's story like Mira and Ophelia like their whole yes <laughs> yes 
that would be, and I don't know, somebody who said, you know, would I ever write like a, another, you know, continue Keyless story? And I feel like probably not, but who knows, but um, totally Obsidia could have like another story and maybe it's with her and Mira. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. well, we have some really fun ones up here. Um, one person's noting, they say, I'm Rain from the Philippines and I'm celebrating my birthday today. And their Aww. question is, <laughs> who is your favorite mermaid in media, whether it's books, TV, movies, or otherwise? I, so I'm a big, huge Disney fan. My students have known that we, we have our Encanto references in class going on right now. <laughs> so, so the Little Mermaid and Ariel is, you know, one of my, my favorites. Um, but um, I like those like a little bit darker mermaids. So I would say Calypso from Pirates of the Caribbean it was really kind of fun and interesting. Um, and she's not technically a mermaid, but she's like a water spirit. Um, so yeah, I like I like those. And like, it, it was interesting, like when the Harry Potter movies were out and like a Goblet of Fire had like this little, the mermaids that were in the lake, the mer people, you know, kind of a little bit scary, a little bit different, but um, Calypso I, I thought was always kind of a mysterious character. So let's see here. Oh, there's so many good ones. I we need more time. <laughs> um, we do actually have a question about um, the cover process, the cover design, and they're wondering if you pick the cover, or I guess perhaps um, maybe how much influence you got to have over the cover. I know you mentioned the designer was looking at your Pinterest. Do you think? Yeah, um, the, the our illustrator. Um, so David Curtis was the designer, and Michael. Um, Mwangi, Makira Mwangi was the illustrator. Um, I saw a sketch um, earlier on um, and I had also seen um, the artist's portfolio was shared with me so I could see his style, which was like amazing. He's got like an Instagram and like, um, you know, art website with his portfolio. Um, I, so generally in publishing, you know, authors don't pick covers. We kind of, you know, leave that to our editors in the, the publishing house to decide what makes sense. But I really had, I was really happy that I got a lot of, um, you know, things shared with me. Um, and I could say, yeah, I really like it. Cause like everything they do that like was perfect. <laughs> so, so I didn't pick it, but it was, it would have been what I had picked if, if I was given that choice. <laughs> That is the perfect way to do it. <laughs> um, let's see. It looks like we actually had had a question in the chat that I saw mirrored in the Q&A too, wondering, um, oh, I just lost it. Oh, oh wondering about when you um, first knew you wanted to be an author. They're wondering specifically what age. Mm. Actually, so I was a writer as a kid, and um, so I read a ton. I, I lived in the library. The librarians and I had a relationship, and they would save books for me and tell me when new things came in. So that was, you know, I was that kid. And then um, I liked to write, um, but I wasn't like a like a story writer per se. But when we have had creative writing assignments, I really loved those. And I I remember in high school. Um, just being so pleased, like when I got something back from a teacher who just says like, this is really beautiful, or this is that, like, it made me feel like I was good at something. And um, I, and I say that because my brother is an incredible, like graph artist, like, like visual artist. And so I was, <laughs> grew up jealous a little bit, like, I can't draw, I could draw stick figures. And, but, um, you know, I did realize that like I could write well. And, um, but I don't think I, I thought that I seriously about being an author until I was uh, a teacher. Um, I was um, at school and I had decided to go back to graduate school. Um, I started teaching first and then went back to graduate school later and um, was taking some classes on, um, you know, children's literature and um, adolescent writing. And one of the, the projects was to write something and, and we had all, all sorts of choices. And one was a, a fiction project. So I was like, ooh, I could maybe write. So I wrote a, a chapter of a story um, and it was just really fun. And along with some other things that I did for my graduate courses, I uh, um, was talking to a colleague who I think is here. <laughs> She's in the chat I saw who said, you should write a book. Um, 
Marjorie Seeley, uh, you should write a book. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I never thought about that. And um, and I thought maybe I should write a book because I teach these books and all of these wonderful recommendations that I give to kids. And that was really, you know, I think right before I wrote that first draft in 2013, maybe about 2010, 2011, that I started thinking, you know, maybe I, I might want to start learning how to be a writer. So, yeah. I think it's so awesome that you're like, and now you're the teacher encouraging kids to write and like telling them, <laughs> you know, making them feel like, hey, I might be good at this, right? Like you're bringing that out in them too. <laughs> yeah, I definitely had encouragement. And so it's, um, it's been, it's been fun to pass that along and, and they can learn a little bit about publishing just by watching the things that, you know, I have had to do and, and things that I tell, like they all know, all of my students that are in the chat that if I said, what day are book, most books published? I bet they would drop it in the chat in a second. <laughs> what day of the <laughs> week are most books published? <laughs> so, <laughs> So they learn all sorts oh, of things. Oh, that's it. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so there they're getting some publishing knowledge. <laughs> Amazing. Um, let's see. Oh, I wish I could get to all of these questions. We do have one here that's for both of you. Um, wondering oh. if your worlds became, if they merged and you had to pick one character to help introduce the characters from both of the worlds, who would you pick? I think it would have to be Ophidia. Like, I feel like Ophidia could hold her own against the dragon. <laughs> like, dragon. I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like most of the, uh, most of the humans would, it, I'd be worried for them, but, <laughs> but I feel like Ophidia could probably take a couple of the, those dragons. Like she's pretty, she's pretty tough. <laughs> I, that probably is a good choice. Um, and it's so funny about your books. I know kids love them too. I, when I mentioned that you were going to be in conversation, I had one of the, my students say, like, she literally on the drop of a dime recited from memory, the whole Dragonette proph prophecy, <laughs> just <laughs> automatic. Like, and I was like, and you memorize that? She's like, oh yeah, for a while, I've had the whole thing memorized. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so lovely. Um, well, they might be interested to know the ones who are here that the one of the showrunners for uh, the TV show is in the chat as well. I was very excited to see her here. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah, it's been really fun to kind of like revisit the 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 books, the the, the initial books, and <laughs> um, think about how they might translate visually. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you both for answering that. That's a, that was a fun question. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, we have one here actually um, wondering what has been the most surprising part of being a debut author, especially with the past two years? Well, surprising. Um, it's, I was really grateful that, you know, my book um, didn't come out in 2020 because I, I have a lot of friends who had to pivot when the pandemic started and that was really stressful for um, authors. And then I think, you know, people kind of started to get their footing. Um, but, you know, I know some of my friends in my debut group are in the chat that most of us probably expected we would be back to in-person events like, oh, 2022, it's still 18 months away. So, you know, that's been surprising. But, um, you know, like I said, there's, you still, there's so many, like to see that books still make it out into the world and that, you know, readers, books are still finding their readers, like that's exciting and wonderful. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, it's been just surprising just to learn about all the steps. I mean, publishing is a slow industry, industry and we all, you know, once you're in it, you kind of learn that, but, um, you know, my editor is wonderful and she's always like sending me little, just like for your information type of things. And I appreciate that so much because, you know, I don't know the industry. So just about like how things are done and just all the explaining, explaining things that um, just for somebody who is learning is great. <laughs> so that's surprising how, how much work goes into a book. Actually, um, kind of coming off that in terms of just how it's felt with this debut, um, we do have a question wondering what you do to celebrate or what you are doing to celebrate this debut. <laughs> Today, I went to um, a bookstore and signed some books. So I found my book in the wild out in like real life. And um, 
find some books and left some bookmarks at a bookstore. And I'm planning to do that again, especially with all these books that are being ordered through Brookline Booksmith. It's exciting. Um, a friend of mine who's in the chat um, said that I should get cake. And I haven't gotten cake yet, but I'm planning to by the weekend get some cake. <laughs> so that will be another way we'll celebrate. I see someone in the chat also suggesting you bring your students cookies to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what I can do about that. <laughs> yeah, I think I vote ice cream. Ice cream for me is the, the best way to uh, celebrate. <laughs> anything good to eat is a good nice way to celebrate. <laughs> we have a, a comment here that your students should bring you cookies. <laughs> I like that one too. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> and, um, and actually, as hard as it is to believe, we are nearing the hour. And I think there's a great uh, question. Speaking of your students, there's a great one to end on. Um, Ms. Stringfellow, what tips did you use that we've talked about in class while writing? Oh, good question. Putting me on the spot. <laughs> I would say there's a lot of things. So um, Tui mentioned this, the importance of putting aside your writing. Um, and coming back to it kind of with fresh eyes, that's something that I do a lot. You know, you get working on something, you kind of develop, um, you know, just amnesia about certain things or just not seeing like details the way you should. So that's really helpful. Um, as much as you guys might not like to hear it, reading your work aloud is really helpful. So read your work or listen to your work so that you can hear it and how it sounds. That's something that I do. Um, honestly, guys, most of the things that I tell you, I do try to do myself. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not just making those up to, to torture you or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. Do you do like, do they read each other's work and give each other comments? Is that? Um... They do. In fact, tomorrow, my fifth graders who are here, we're doing some peer review of something that they wrote. But um, for their NaNoWriMo stories, actually, we, we made critique groups and they didn't know. So, you know, they're used to peer editing, just, you know, more like the line editing type of thing. But we actually made critique groups where they had a small group and they shared a piece of their writing and they would ask for feedback like this is what I'd like to know. And that was kind of a different process. But it's what, you know, we that are, you know, writers kind of you know pr more professionally know that's really helpful to share your work and ask for the kind of feedback that you need. So we've done that in class. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I think having a good writing group or people you trust to read it over is um, it just invaluable. <laughs> yeah. And then they're there to celebrate with you. Yes. Like we yes, are tonight. They are. <laughs> so on that note, um, I would love to thank you, Tui and Lisa, for speaking together and with everyone who attended tonight. This was such a fun uh, Q&A session and reading. Um, and to all of you who joined us, thank you for participating and helping us celebrate the launch of A Comb of Wishes. This has been wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I do see a question about the link for the book. Yes, um, I'm putting that in the chat again now. Um, I have both the registration link where you can get your book through there until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning if you'd like it personalized. Um, otherwise, I do just have the regular link to the book through our store as well. You can find it on our shelves and online anytime. Um, but thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Thank you all. Fun. And thank you, Rachel and Brookline Booksmith. Thank you, Tui, for being here and the wonderful questions. And thank you to everybody who came. Yeah. And I didn't get to read all the chat, so I hope we get to save it. But <laughs> I hope yeah, see if so. you can. <laughs> this will be yes. This is at least it's live streamed to YouTube. Um, we should have a recording soon too, so that should help. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll have a.